you have me? Good? Okay, cool. Hi everyone, my name is uh, Sebastian Guasgen. I'm French, I live in Switzerland. Uh, I work for Citrix, but in the open source office, so I'm not here to sell anything. Uh, so we're gonna talk about Apache CloudStack, the, uh, the open source solution. As uh, KB said, um, I worked a lot on Open Nebula back in uh, 2009. I was at CERN when they, they deployed their first clouds with Open Nebula. Later on, they moved to uh, OpenStack. Um, I have a little bit of experience with Eucalyptus and uh, probably one day with OpenStack uh, a couple of years back. But today, it's CloudStack. Uh, so what, what are we talking about here? Uh, I'm going to give you like some, some brief you know, concepts about CloudStack and Apache Software Foundation because it's a top-level project at the uh, ASF. Uh, then I'm going to go into you know, some installation principles and talk a little bit about packages uh, because that's you know, CentOS community, so I thought that would be relevant. And then I'll go into some clients and the tools that you can use with, uh, with CloudStack to basically you know, provision virtual machines and, and whatnot. Uh, so you know, starting off, I mean, the, the landscape here of cloud, it's infrastructure as a service. Uh, and as I said, you know, uh, historically, Eucalyptus was probably the first one that came out as uh, trying to be a clone for Amazon EC2. Uh, Open Nebula in Spain was uh, not far behind. That was probably 2006, even before. Um, OpenStack was, uh, you know, started and founded in 2010, I think. And CloudStack uh, was bought by Citrix in uh, 2011, but it started as a, as a startup back in uh, 08. Uh, in Silicon Valley, okay. Overt, I don't know when Overt started, uh, Red Hat, and then Ganeti is another interesting project from Google. Even though it's for you know smaller size clouds, maybe uh, I was looking at it the other day, maybe like 40, 40 nodes or so. So we are, we, you know, that's that's what we're looking about. You know, there are different open source solutions out there. You can pick uh, the one you like, or uh, you can try to uh, basically evaluate all of them. And we're going to talk about CloudStack uh, today. Really what those are, uh, they are data center orchestrator. They are trying to uh, manage your uh, hypervisors in your data center so that you can provision virtual machines on demand. It's a very good use case for uh, build and test environment, uh, like we've heard about, like for continuous integration, uh, but also for very large scale uh, infrastructure. Zynga is one uh, CloudStack user. They do social gaming uh, on Facebook, and they, they have that type of infrastructure. Uh, public cloud providers, of course, so guys who, who were into web hosting and are evolving their business into providing, um, you know, on-demand services. Uh, they're, they're moving to, uh, to clouds and using some of those uh, systems. But basically, all of those, what they do, they manage uh, compute, so hypervisors, and then they manage uh, networking services that go with it to, uh, to allocate IP addresses and uh, uh, VPNs, uh, private clouds, uh, security groups, firewalls, load balancers, and so on. And also you have, uh, you know, you need to manage the, the storage, not, not in the sense of offering storage, but in the sense of having some uh, back-end storage to support all the virtual machine images. So, you know, think about, you know, of course, NFS, but then large-scale storage like uh, Ceph, Gluster, uh, Swift uh, from OpenStack, and, and so on. So the, those YAS system, they, they deal with you know, everything at that, at that layer. And of course, they need to handle failures, support large scale, you know, potentially 10,000s of hypervisors in the very big data centers from the, the big internet companies. And a, a key aspect to me, you know, really what moved to cloud is that they're all programmable. So all of those systems, they offer an API, and that's really uh, heaven for uh, developers. You know, they just need to learn that API uh, hopefully there's going to be some standard or there is some standardi standardization effort. We could talk about that. But all those systems, they offer an API. So, you know, most likely HTTP based and then, you know, REST or query API. Just learn that API, hit it, and you'll be able to, you know, spawn VMs and configure them and whatnot. So CloudStack is one of uh, such data center orchestrator and it's uh, programmable. You know, if you don't like YAS or if you don't like cloud, just talk about a programmable data center orchestrator. You know, VMware talks about software-defined data centers, of course, you know. And, uh, and CloudStack is, a, is now a top-level project at the Apache Software Foundation together with, of course, HTTP and, and, and many others. Uh, you know, basically, what you, when you install CloudStack, what you get, uh, you get all of this, okay? So you get, you know, 
services that manage the hypervisors. So you need a form of hypervisor. You pick uh, Zen, KVM, uh, VMware, uh, Hyper-V is coming. Uh, we used to have OVM, Oracle VM, which is a flavor of Zen, but actually uh, we, we removed it. It may come back. And uh, bare metal, so you can do bare metal provisioning. We also have LXC support in there. Uh, storage, that's really the storage needed to support the virtual machines that you're going to run. So there, you know, basic NFS, as I was saying, we now have uh, Ceph uh, through the RBD support. Uh, Swift, OpenStack Swift can actually be used. Disney is using Swift plus CloudStack. Uh, you name it, lots of storage solution. And then networking, you know, as I was saying, we do load balancers. So a lot of things that are software defined, I'm going to show you. We have a, a VM running in CloudStack, which is called a virtual router. And that virtual router is actually a little virtual machine that has uh, a DNS mask, uh, uh, DHCP, uh, HA proxy, uh, and so on to serve uh, network services. We can also hook up uh, physical uh, networking devices. Uh, so uh, Juniper SRX, firewalls, uh, uh, load balancers, uh, F5 load balancers, Cisco, and so on. Uh, well, they're, they're here. Uh, so CloudStack is going to do all of this. Also do image management, so managing the, uh, your templates, your, uh, your, your root disk images. Uh, it provides a dashboard. I'm going to show you the dashboard. And it has identity management, so you know, uh, managing your, all your accounts, uh, your groups, your users in those accounts, and, and so on. Uh, and everything is integrated as a Java application. And m storage, compute, and network are uh, very easy plugins. So if you want to bring in your, uh, a new hypervisor, a new storage system, a new networking service, you just write a new plugin and you put it in. I think the difference with OpenStack is that OpenStack has all of those components but each of them is actually uh, REST-based, so you could technically you know, install them on different machines and just they talk to each other through uh, their REST API. For us, it's much more of a traditional Java application, and, and you write plugin uh, to, to bring in new functionality. Uh, it has you know, its own API that I was saying. It's a programmable data center orchestrator, so it has its own, own API. But we also have a, a bridge that does the mapping between Amazon EC2 and our API. So if you're using EC2 now, you've developed tools that, that use EC2. If you use Boto, for example, you could uh, just use uh, CloudStack with it. Uh, and it does metering. So we have, you know, of course, a database. We, have, we use MySQL you know, as, as the database. And there is a, a database in there uh, for usage. So if you're trying to do metering and billing, you can just look at the, the usage database. So that gives you an, I an idea of you know, everything that's, that's in there. Uh, so we like Apache a lot. You know, it's, in, it's in Apache, of course. We, we used to be in incubation. We graduated. We're now top level project. That's kind of the marketing line, you know, the web server of the cloud because of HTTP between being in, uh, in, uh, in the SF. Now, of course, the SF, you guys all know of the SF. Any Apache commuters? Uh, so you get, you know, uh, HTTP I mentioned, Spam, Assassin, Tomcat, uh, Cocoon from a long time, Ant and Maven. So all the Java developers, they, you know, they love Apache because of a lot of the tools for Java developments are in Apache. Uh, what we're seeing in Apache now is that, you know, we're seeing more and more uh, big data software. So Hadoop, HDFS is within the Apache Software Foundation. Uh, all the Hadoop ecosystem, or most of the Hadoop ecosystem, like HBase, uh, what else? Uh, I mean, Weir, uh, and so on. It's it's in um, it's at DSF, and currently there is a vote going on to bring Storm. I don't know if you guys know Storm. It's for uh, it comes from Twitter. It's the the real time uh, processing of uh, real time feeds. So Storm is going to join the uh, DSF. Uh, of course, Cassandra, the, the distributed database, CouchDB also is in there. So, you know, lots of interesting components that, you know, if you think of it and you're trying to build your cloud, not only just the compute side, but you're also trying to address the big data challenge and so on, you can find all those components at the SF. And what that gives you is that, you know, it's the same governance model, it's the same way of contributing, so you get used to it in, in, in different projects. The, the reason that Citrix open sourced it, you know, they bought cloud.com and then the reason they, they open sourced it was really to, to build a community around that because, 
it's pretty clear these days that as a single company, it's difficult to carry you know one product and make it relevant to to all the, you know not only the customers but the entire community. So the idea was to build a community around that software, and of course you know facilitate the the ecosystem around it and get faster time to market for people who are trying to integrate their own product, for users who want the other products plugged in. It's much easier if it's open source and anybody can, uh, can contribute. And the cho choice of ASF you know, was pretty clear uh, at the time because it's you know, highly recognized you know, coming from uh, HTTP. And uh, all the processes to contribute to, uh, to a project at the ASF are very clear. Uh, they're not always easy. I mean, we could argue whether it's a good model or, or not, but if you want to contribute to an open source project uh, within ASF, it's extremely uh, to do it. You just join the mailing list, you start participating, you submit patches, and then you get uh, access right to the, to the repo. <laughs> it may take a while. Uh, so in terms of CloudStack, you know, we joined Apache April 2012, and then this is just um, a graph of uh, contributors monthly. So we see that you know, we've grown quite a bit. Uh, it's not as, see as steep as uh, OpenStack. Uh, you know, of course, OpenStack has lots of uh, momentum. But we are roughly these days you know, over 200, 200 participants on the mailing list every month. Okay? So it's a pretty active um, community. Uh, the, the pros and cons you know, of ASF, the pros is that uh, companies don't have a say. Okay? If I'm a big company and I'm trying to influence a, a software, I cannot come to the, uh, the Apache Software Foundation and say, okay, here is $10 million, I'm joining, and I want CloudStack to do this. Okay? That's not going to happen. Okay? Uh, companies don't have a say at the SF, it's really the individuals. So if you go to the website of the SF, you won't see any uh, big names of, uh, of contribution. So no company affiliation. Uh, I'm not from Citrix at the Apache Software Foundation. I'm, I'm uh, my email, basically. Um, and no vendor lock-in. You know, of course, uh, open source. Cons, you know, heavy processes. Uh, we could talk about that. Weak marketing, there is no money, so there is no marketing efforts towards those uh, projects. Uh, you can see at some of the websites, you know, they're, they're not very, uh, very fancy. A tad old fashioned in the way things work. Uh, you know, th everything through email can be a little bit painful. Um, and it's very developer centric. So the users sometimes are a little bit at a loss because they join the mailing list and they see like all oh, that ton of email about development. Uh, so it's uh, a bit developer centric. But the big thing is that there is definitely no vendor lock in. Uh, the process is everything is by email. Uh, so, you know, we if something needs to be decided, the decision is not something needs to be discussed. It needs to be to happen on the mailing list. If it happens outside the mailing list, it didn't happen. Okay, so you join CloudStack, and then suddenly you're gonna start getting, you know, three thousand email a month. Okay, on the dev list. Uh, so you know, we we vote on uh, committer status. Uh, we vote on releases. Everything happens through email. And once you join the once you're a committer, and also. Uh, Actually, I have to check that. Uh, here we were voting on the release, so you know you, you test the release, you vote plus one, and then there was a guy here that voted minus one. So basically, he canned the release. Um, in fact, that shouldn't have happened, but you know he, he voted minus one on the release, so we had to revote. Okay. So the bottom line is that anybody has a anybody has a vote and uh, and rights. Uh, in terms of companies, even though there is no affiliation at the SF, I mean, all those people, you know, they come from different companies. You can get an idea of the, the company backing behind, SF, uh, behind CloudStack by looking at the domains of the emails. It gives you a rough idea. It's not perfect because a company could have one guy and it doesn't mean that the entire company is behind it, okay? Uh, if there is one guy from ITV that sends an email tomorrow, I would do plus one here. So anyway, you, 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 you look at the monthly, you know, we have a good increase, roughly, you know, 60, 60 to 80 companies a month that, that participate. Uh, and so we have contributions from lots of different people. The, the vice president of CloudStack is a guy from SunGuard. Uh, guys from Schubert Phyllis in Amsterdam, they do a lot of work on software-defined networking. React CS, which is this new startup that does uh, the object store, I mean, it's Basho, actually, the, the name of the startup, but they do the... React CS subject store, they contributed. They have one of their guys on our uh, management committee. Citrix, of course, SolidFire, they, they, they contributed a plugin. 
uh, cloud stack. LeaseWeb is a public cloud provider in the um, Netherlands. They're also in the US and so on. And ShapeBlue is actually a, a UK company. So they're based here in London and they do a lot of uh, cloud stack uh, consulting and uh, uh, support. So lots of different uh, companies involved. So let's look a little bit at the, uh, the installation process. Uh, and to be frank, I've never done the installation on CentOS. So it's not that I've made it up, but the part that talks about packages is untested from my side of view. So, you know, it's a Java application. So who is a big Java guy here? Oh, okay, okay, at least one, okay. <laughs> Okay, so it's built with Maven. Uh, it runs on Tomcat and it has a MySQL database uh, behind it. So you want to install, you know, install MySQL, install Maven, install Tomcat, uh, clone the repository, uh, check out a stable branch. This is actually not released yet, uh, but it's pretty stable. Uh, you do the, you deploy the database. I forgot a line here, okay? So I, I didn't do the, uh, the install. So there is a maven-p developer install. That's really for developers, okay? I, we, I'm not expecting users to do this. But basically you deploy the database and then you run the app here. That's for development with, the, with JT. And then you, you hit the management server here uh, running like this. So you do this. Technically, everything works fine. In 20 minutes, you have the CloudStack management server running on that node, and you, you have the UI. Uh, I was bored, I just put it in Chinese. Uh, but we have uh, different languages. Uh, for the UI, we have maybe 15 languages. Okay, so that, you know, that, works, uh, that works well. So that's the, <coughs> that's the dashboard. So that's one node that runs the management server with the MySQL database. I didn't talk about installing agents, okay? So you need a form of hypervisor KVM Zen, and on those uh, nodes, you're gonna need to install something. If it's Zen, you don't have anything to do because we talk directly to the Zen API, XAPI. If it's KVM, then we need to install an agent. Uh, unfortunately, it's a Java, Java agent, but basically you'll point to the repo, and then you'll do a yum install uh, cloud stack agent that will install the, uh, the agent and it will talk to libvirt to, to then interact. Uh, VMware, we talk directly to vCenter, uh, things like this. Uh, so that's the management server. And at the beginning, you know, you install things. Uh, here, you have zeros everywhere. That means that you didn't define any data center. There are no pods, no racks, no nodes in there. There is no storage. There is no system uh, VM, no router. Okay, no nothing. So once you have that, you actually need to install, uh, to define your data center. That's where things may become a little bit tricky and hopefully before you've done that, you've thought about all your networking and how you, you're going to, uh, to set up all the traffic and everything. Uh, so you get the dashboard and of course you automatically get the API server uh, and the API has probably 300 methods available in there. Uh, you can do anything, create uh, networks, delete them, uh, virtual private cloud, virtual machine, uh, static NAT, uh, source NAT, uh, uh, add storage, uh, really lots of things. Uh, people used to say that it was a REST API. So in my view, I mean, that could be a debate, but in my view, it's not a REST API. Uh, it's HTTP based, but it's a query API in the sense that you pass a command and then you pass parameters, key value pairs in it. It's not a pure REST API where you define a, uh, a URI and you hit it with, uh, you know, get, delete, uh, put, patch here. Everything is get and you pass parameters, okay? So technically it's really a query API. Uh, if you run the, uh, the dashboard and then you start an instance, for example, I mean, here that's the instance uh, where you view things. Uh, you'll see the API, well, I guess it's way too small for the back, but, you know, command, you pass the command, and then you have a list of key value pairs there. Uh, let's try to stay awake. And so that's the default, that's the default cloud stack. Uh, since I'm in Switzerland, I know these guys, they're Exoscale. It's a public cloud provider in Switzerland. 
and it's pretty cool because you can get a free account and you get they give you 50 francs you just put your password your uh, email and password and you get the account you don't have to enter any billing information so that's very nice and these guys they run CloudStack uh, but they, they totally redid the UI okay so they run CloudStack but they just use the API to build their own UI with uh, Bootstrap and uh, Angular okay so their dashboard is very simple okay it's nothing fancy but if you just if you're just looking for VMs it works great uh, instances I have nothing they have what we call a basic zone which means that uh, all the nodes basically they get a public IP address and the uh, isolation between all the instances is done via security groups just like Amazon okay so you have security groups key pairs you access your machines with key pairs SSH, SSH key pairs uh, job status whatever doesn't matter so let's start an instance uh, they're still they're still beginning so for them you cannot actually uh, put in your own image you have to use uh, a list of existing images okay so CentOS Dojo they only have one zone CloudStack can can manage multiple zones so they could have multiple data centers in there but then they only have one zone and so they give you as I said they give you uh, predefined templates you cannot upload the template right now on that cloud it's not a, a problem with the uh, it's not a problem with CloudStack, it's just the way they set it up. Of course, you define your uh, instance type, so let's do small. Uh, you can attach different disks, okay? You specify a key pair, SSH key pair, and then uh, a security group, okay? Um, unfortunately, they don't use CentOS, they use Ubuntu and, uh, and KVM. But we're gonna try to start a, a CentOS machine. And uh, as I'm doing it, I realize that I actually have never done a CentOS machine here. Yeah. So it should work. While we do this, um, this is the source tree of CloudStack. It's big. Uh, I don't do Java, and uh, I'm not going to touch this with the. But anyway. If you run in development, uh, Maven uh, profile, and then you run it in, uh, with JT, so I'm not running uh, Tomcat here. So I'm going to run the CloudStack management server here on my laptop. Uh, I have a MySQL uh, database. It's bad. It doesn't have a root password. Uh, so I'm running MySQL on my laptop, and I have a cloud, cloud bridge. Those are specific to... Uh, uh, what is it? Uh, specific to CloudStack. So you have, you know, lots of tables in there, volumes, VM, um, security groups, uh, you name it. Uh, that's because I didn't set up uh, sudo properly. So I have MySQL and I have the source code, I compiled it, I'm running it, and management server has started here. Uh, so we should be able, as I said in the slides, we should be able to refresh this. Okay. Admin password is the default. And here you have the, uh, the almost default cloud stack, as I was saying. So mach uh, machine images in templates, uh, account, account management and their accounts, uh, infrastructure, I'm going to get back to that. Lots of configuration variable for your cloud. Um, service offering, that's the machine types, instance types for EC2. You can also provide disk offerings. Uh, that's like actually the equivalent of uh, Elastic Block Store, I guess. Um, and in infrastructure here, you see that we actually have defined something. We have a zone, okay, which is a data center, a pod, which is roughly uh, a rack. Uh, and within that pod, we have a cluster, okay? And within, a, within cluster, we have a host. And here we only have one, okay? Uh, it's a, Zen host. 
Uh, the cluster is actually a homogeneous set of hosts. So in a, in a particular data center or even a, in a rack, you could mix KVM, Zen, and VMware. Okay? If you had different hypervisors, you could mix that. They would just be in different. Here you would have three clusters. One Zen cluster, one KVM cluster, and so on. Uh, No, this, this is the admin view. Yes. Yeah. You can put it as, uh, you can put it in the template or you can put it as uh, a tag. Every... Is it, is it okay to the end user? Yeah, yeah. For example, if I'm setting up, for instance, I'm trying to say, okay, I want this one to be in KVM, I want this one to be in Uh Yeah, so I, I understood the question, but I think... I think it depends how the admins set it up. I think they can hide it, uh, or they can uh, actually make it very clear that it's, a, it's an image for a particular type. Or when you deploy, when you do a deploy virtual machine, you could say deploy that VM on a, a host that has the Zen tag or on a host that has a VMware tag. I've never, I've never, done, it, I've never done it like this myself. But I think I've, I've used a couple clouds where it, you, know, you, you had that information what, that it was, what type of hypervisor it was. I'll look it up. We have two types of storage. Uh, secondary storage, which is basically storage that is available, uh, shared across all the zone, so that all the nodes in your data center, they can you know, fetch images from that storage. Okay, so it's zone-wide. That's where we use uh, Swift, for example, OpenStack Swift. It's to provide an object store zone-wide so that you can go fetch uh, images anywhere you are in the data center. Uh, the, the primary storage, that's storage that's defined at the cluster level. So if you have a you know, CentOS K KVM or CentOS Zen cluster, you define primary storage so that when the instances run, uh, the images of those running instances are on primary storage. So it could be local disk, it could be cluster LVM, it could be Ceph, uh, you name it, but that's uh, primary storage. Um, so if I had four clusters here, I would have four, prim four primary storage defined. Okay. System VMs are little appliances that are running in the cloud uh, by default uh, that give us things like uh, proxy, cons console proxy, uh, manage, manage all the, the template movement, all the snapshotting across the data center. Okay, so those are actual VMs that are running uh, in def by default. And then there is this router that uh, provides uh, networking services. So if you don't have any specific networking devices, a physical hardware device, and you need uh, DHCP, DNS, blah, 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 uh, you would have a virtual router running that would provide this uh, for the, the guest instances. Uh, okay, so let's go here in instance. Since I'm here, we're going to try to start an instance here as well. It's all on my laptop, so I'll, I'll show you what's going on actually, but tiny, tiny Linux template only available, no disk, no affinity group, uh, no network, whatever. CentOS. And what's happening here is that I, I'm actually running a hypervisor in there. So in VirtualBox, I'm running something we call DevCloud. So I have a virtual machine running in my laptop, this one here. Uh, and that's uh, unfortunately uh, Debian, okay? But it's a Zen. And the VM here that I'm trying to launch is going to launch in that hypervisor, okay? That's why in the infrastructure, it looks like I only have one host, okay? It's that virtual box uh, setup. And I think it's, yeah, okay. So the instance started. Um, if I were to log in onto the VM, I would get it. That's the console access. Let's, let's try to see if I can get the console. Uh, Uh. 
So that's that's Zen. So if you do v XC VM list, okay, that's the only hypervisor in my data center. Everything on my laptop. So what we see, we have that secondary storage VM running. We have that uh, that's the console proxy. That's Dom Zero. If you know Zen, uh, that's the virtual router R, and that's the instance I25. That's the instance that's running. So I actually have, you know four very tiny Linux VM running in that VirtualBox instance. It's kind of convoluted, but it's good for, t it's good for testing, okay? Uh, and here the console has uh, started. Uh, and no secret, it's root password. This is, this is all for development. Okay, so I've started a VM in that VirtualBox uh, hypervisor everything on the laptop. Okay, so that's actually uh, what we did here with the dev environment. Uh, no, sorry, that's not what we did. Uh, in CloudStack, you can also use a simulator. So if you're doing development, okay, you launch the management server, it's very easy. But if you want to test things, you can run a simulator to simulate that, that data center that you have. So we can use something that's called Marvin. And then here, uh, I mean, that's a Maven command, but here you define a configuration file that's actually a JSON. And that JSON file defines you know, the number of zones, the, the type of storage, uh, the number of hypervisor, the number of clusters. So you could simulate your, your data center in advance by defining it in that JSON file. You feed it to, uh, to the CloudStack simulator and then just on your laptop, you would have that fake data center uh, for testing. The other way to do things is what, is what I just did here, which is DevCloud, where on my machine, I'm running that Ubuntu uh, setup, uh, well, Debian actually, Zen kernel, uh, and I have the, the management server on my laptop, the MySQL, and the VMs are actually launched insta inside that uh, virtual box image, okay? That's, that's DevCloud. So instead of the simulator, you can just use the sandbox. With the sandbox, you can actually run the management server. You can run everything inside it. If you don't want to mess with in your laptop, you just run also the management server in the sandbox. That's going to work. So all, the, all those are nice tools if you want to you know, have a look and, uh, and start messing with things. Uh, you know, of course, if you're trying to install it you know, for real, do a POC or things like this, uh, you need to look at packages. And CloudStack, I mean, it's actually Apache. Uh, we only release uh, source. There are only uh, source releases, OK? So Apache, as an Apache project, we're not going to release uh, binaries, OK? So we release source. And what's happening is that the binaries are hosted by uh, you know, community members. So here, actually, there is a, there is a, a repo here, apt-get uh, EU. It's actually in, um, in Amsterdam, somewhere in Amsterdam. Uh, one of the guys from the, the community is, uh, is hosting, uh, hosting that for us. So CentOS, you know, define your YUM repo, point, point, to, uh, point to that repo, app get EU, RHEL 4.1 being, being the latest stable release of CloudStack. 4.2 should come out in the next days. I said that four weeks ago. <laughs> And then, you know, don't mess with Maven, of course. Get back on your feet with YUM. YUM install CloudStack management. And that will give you CloudStack setup database to set up all the tables. Uh, and then that will give you CloudStack setup management uh, to basically run the, uh, the, that dashboard as a, as a service. OK? Uh, that's all there is to it, except the typo here, management. Uh, I've never done it on CentOS. so. I need to check that. You know, of course, there are different uh, configuration. Uh, you know, running the management server is actually super easy. Okay, Tomcat, MySQL, run the packages. The tough part, and I, th I think for any cloud, okay, Open Nebula, OpenStack, and so on, the tough part is actually going to add the rest of the infrastructure. Uh, so all the hypervisors, VM or Zen, the way you're going to do networking with the bridges or uh, Open vSwitch or things like this. You know, that's going to require some configuration. That's where some, you know, most of the time there is, uh, there is trouble. 
Um, you also need storage, you know, to serve those images. So as I said, you know, the easiest would be CentOS, KVM, or CentOS Zen, and NFS. You just use NFS for, uh, for storage across <coughs> the zone, and NFS for uh, primary storage. Uh, a lot of people actually use local storage for, uh, for primary storage when the, when the image run, but then you don't have things like migration and, and so on. Uh, quite a few people are moving to Ceph these days. Of course, you know, same thing, RHEL, Zen, NFS, local storage, uh, Ubuntu, KVM, Swift Stack, uh, Ceph, uh, RHEL, KVM, React CS, Cluster LVM. I mean, it really depends what you're using, uh, you know, in your companies or uh, in, your, uh, in your lab. Uh, you, you can really uh, pick. Uh, now, you know, of course, it's not all rosy uh, because depending on the exact versions, uh, OS versions, there may be uh, bugs in libvirt or things like this uh, that make it, you know, not compatible with this version of storage or not. Uh, so I wish it would be, you know, super plug and play like this, but sometimes there are, you know, little uh, glitches. But basically, you know, take your pick like this, and then map out your network. That'll probably be the, uh, the, the toughest part of, uh, of everything. Now, you know, getting back to, uh, to SF, CloudStack is great. And if you need big data, you also have uh, Hadoop and Storm. But there are lots of tools that you're going to need in addition. And we've, we saw Foreman. Uh, so I was curious what Foreman was using. It's using Fog. Um, but at SF, there is a tool that's very well known, which is JClouds. And really, you know, there used to be a big battle on the standardization of uh, web services with SOAP and so on. Uh, and it all went away when people uh, discovered uh, or rediscovered REST, I would say. Um, but basically, when cloud started, I mean, that's my view, is that people said, okay, let's not worry about standards. Let's, let's write wrappers on top of that that talk to all the existing uh, setup. So something like JCloud is actually a wrapper that uh, you use as a library. It's a Java library. And it talks to uh, you know, OpenStack, uh, CloudStack, uh, Yuka, EC2. Uh, I mean, lots of different clouds. Not only software, but existing cloud, uh, probably Cloud Sigma and, and so on. So that's a wrapper. And if you're trying to develop Java application, and you're looking for something, a library that you can, you're going to be able to use on multiple clouds so that you're not locked in in a particular one. I mean, JCloud is probably uh, great. And I, I just added that one because he was talking about continuous integration. There is uh, a JCloud plugin in Jenkins. So all of you out there doing uh, continuous integration, you have Jenkins running. Uh, you could install the JCloud plugin. That means that right suddenly you can start spawning Jenkins slaves on any clouds that you have access to, okay, including CloudStack clouds. Uh, it work, works great. Another wrapper uh, that's more for Ruby guys, it's Delta Cloud, came out from, uh, from Red Hat. Same thing, again, you know, they, they were not wanting to, to worry about standardization, so they said, okay, let's build you know, one API to rule them all, kind of, or a wrapper. And basically, Delta Cloud was a way to, uh, to access you know, multiple cloud providers or you know, cloud software. Delta Cloud is very nice because it's, it actually offers you a standard, a DMTF CME standard. That's one of the, the only standards out there with uh, OCCI from the uh, Open Grid Forum. So Delta Cloud gives you a standard as a front end, and it talks to multiple backends. Um, Delta Cloud has kind of stalled. Uh, Apache Weir is very nice if you're looking into uh, big data. Uh, it uses JClouds, okay? So it's basically a setup that's going to talk to be able to provision on any of those clouds, being able to provision uh, Hadoop nodes, uh, Elasticsearch clusters, Cassandra, uh, you name it, okay? So Weir is, is the application that can provision and orchestrate the, uh, the deployment of multiple instances and, and then bootstrap uh, everything. Uh, Let's, let's, la let's have a look at that, actually, because I think that's... Um, KB, you, t you tell me about time? Huh? Yeah. Okay. Um, so where, where, is, uh, where is nice? You define um, a properties file here that says, okay, I want a Hadoop cluster. 
Can you see this in the back? Okay. You define a Hadoop cluster. You define, uh, you said that you want to start that Hadoop cluster with specific key pairs. Uh, you want here, you know, uh, one name node, Hadoop name node, 10 uh, Hadoop uh, task uh, tracker nodes. You define what version of Hadoop you want. So here I'm going to install the Cloudera uh, Hadoop one, uh, key file. I mean, that's kind of the boring, geeky part, but and you, then, then you define your uh, endpoint. So here you see I'm going to, to try to use that, uh, that Swiss uh, provider. So where we'll go like this, it will, it will be a launch cluster, config, and the config file, <coughs> okay? I haven't tried it in a long time, so I don't know what's gonna happen. Uh, if we go back here, uh, so that one, has, that one has started. Uh, that's the CentOS that I started before. You see that it's in the default security group, exascale, that's my key pair. And it, they're nice, they give you a public IP so you don't need to mess with the mapping. Uh, oh, that didn't like that. So let's try to SSH to that uh, SSH ID, RSA, exascale. I just hope that it plays the key pair properly because I've never done it on CentOS. Ooh. Yeah. What is it? Okay, great. So that's my, uh, that's my instance. That's my CentOS machine that I started. How do I check if it's CentOS? LSB release. It's in, where is it? There you go. Okay. Provision the CentOS node on that cloud. On that, uh, cloud. Uh, where has failed? Mm, too bad. Image ID not found. They must, uh, they must have changed the image IDs. Okay. Uh, let's try something else. JClouds hardware list. JClouds, even though JClouds is a, a Java library, it also comes with uh, a CLI. Okay. So if you're looking for a CLI, uh, just install uh, JClouds. Okay. So you get the machine types. It's typical. It's not super nice, uh, but it's typical of CloudStack that uh, they have UIDs. Uh, so the names are not coming up. By default, JClouds doesn't give you the names of the actual instance types. It gives you the UIDs, okay? Uh, I think it's template list. No. Image list. So all those tools pr play nice with each other. But it's kind of, you see, the default J clouds is not super useful. Uh, this is a wild, wild attempt at making it work. So it failed because the template ID I, I gave was not uh, was not valid, and here it looks like it's working. Okay, cool. So now on my cloud, I'm uh, spawning those ten machines. One of them being that Hadoop name node, and the other ones being those uh, task tracker. Uh, 
technically you don't want to do this on that cloud because all those machines they get public IPs so if you have to set up the uh, security groups properly for Hadoop you know, it may not be good to have a Hadoop cluster on a public internet like this um, just because some of, some of the ports that you need to open for Hadoop you know you're not going to be able to to secure them properly so anyway now what's going to happen is that it's going to bootstrap them it's not using Puppet here, it's using a basic bash script to, uh, to uh, configure everything. You, I think you could use Puppet with Wear, but I've never done it. Another tool that uh, there I do a little bit of development, it's LibCloud. So again, it's one of those wrappers and it's Python. So whether you are, if you're Java, use JCloud. If you're Ruby, look at Delta Cloud. If you're Python, look at LibCloud and all of those are SF projects. Uh, LibCloud, again, has uh, basically a lowest common denominator uh, API that you're going to be able to use on all those clouds. Um, Rackspace, it's pushed, I mean, not pushed, but it's mostly developed by Rackspace guys. SoftLayer, uh, Open Nebula, Brightbox, I mean, OpenStack, of course. The Rackspace driver is a uh, uh, class uh, derived from the OpenStack uh, driver. And now we have uh, CloudStack. I worked a lot on the, on the driver. And the way it looks like, I'm not going to give you the full demo, but basically in Python, import the, uh, the libcloud drivers, instantiate a CloudStack driver, give your uh, keys. You know, any of those clouds, they have API key, secret key. So here, that's what you're doing, secret key. Uh, the, the host and the path and then once you've done that basically you go list locations to get the list of all the zones kind of like availability zones in EC2 list images sizes list nodes and then create a node uh, give it a name pass the image pass a machine type define some extra arguments this has changed I, I changed that uh, and then you get a node uh, in libcloud, you can also deploy, so you can actually specify scripts uh, that you want to run. So if you want to deploy a CentOS machine and a yum update, you can actually pass yum update to that command, and it's going to, to deploy it, and it uses uh, Paraminko module uh, in Python. So it SSHs into the instance and, and runs everything. And, and these commands are actually the, the default API. So any of those commands are going to work on any of the clouds that are supported by uh, libcloud. Uh, where it becomes cloud stack specific is when we talk about extension methods, the EX. And here, you know, we have uh, security groups, create security group, delete these key pairs, create key pairs. Uh, those are actually common with the EC2 uh, driver because that's how you work with uh, EC2 uh, creating key pairs and, and security groups. So it looks a lot like uh, the EC2 drive. Uh, so basically, you know, what I wanted to, to show you is was, you know, quick introduction on CloudStack. We're going to look at that Hadoop stuff to see if it worked. But, uh, quick introduction to CloudStack and then, you know, show that at, at within the SF you have lots of, you know, software that can help you build that cloud. CloudStack, of course, Hadoop for big data. Uh, Delta Cloud, Leap Cloud, Jet Clouds, you know, take your pick, uh, has a wrapper to those, uh, to those uh, cloud providers. And, and then, you know, what we're seeing, this is the infrastructure as a service. Now there is also a platform as a service coming up. I mean, you've heard about Cloud Foundry, uh, uh, what is it, AppFog, and then um, OpenShift that are platform as a service solution. And in Apache, we now have uh, Stratos. Uh, from WSO2 that's in incubation. Where is kind of a platform as a service, but it's more of a multi-node orchestration uh, system, okay? So SF, you're gonna find lots of things. Uh, so here you see that's the bootstrapping of the, uh, that's the bootstrapping of, uh, of Hadoop. Uh, it hasn't finished, but you see that, you know, it's trying to get the Cloudera Hadoop distribution, CDH. Uh, I mean, it has to bootstrap 10 nodes, okay? So, so that's why it's taking a while. So the instances are running, but they're not, the bootstrapping hasn't finished, okay? Uh, key pair, you could here, you know, you can of course create a key pair. 
you give it a name and it's going to give you a, a private key. You, you save the private key and the public key is stored. You could actually import, or import one if you want. And uh, Exoscale, they've done it in such a way that once you have that key pair set up, it, when you boot an instance, it's automatically put in the instance and then you have uh, also cloud in it and things like this. So when you do add, you can define user data. Okay. What is it? Okay. So you can write scripts directly here or you can pass those scripts uh, through command line when you start instances. Okay, um, I think that's it for me. I haven't looked at the time, uh, but you know, follow me on Twitter if you have any questions. That's probably the easiest. Or runseb at gmail.com if you want to find me by email. Cloudstack Apache.org, of course, we're on IRC, pound Cloudstack. Uh, lots of uh, content on SlideShare and, uh, and YouTube. And if you want to play with CloudStack, you know, let me know or join the mailing list and uh, put some filters so that you don't get inundated by all the mails. <laughs> and, uh, and then you know, get, uh, get going. We'd love to see uh, you know, better support with CentOS. I mean, especially with the packages, uh, you know, help with the packages, maybe uh, hosting packages uh, somewhere. Uh, we're working through documentation right now because one thing we did very bad it's kind of documentation that we inherited from you know a long time ago, but uh, the installation process between Ubuntu and uh, and uh, CentOS is mixed up. I mean, so it's a, it's done at the same time, okay? So it's very difficult to follow. So we need to break that up and have a Ubuntu installation guide and a CentOS installation guide. Uh, so if some of you are interested, you know, we'd love to get some help on. Uh, looking at those packages and, uh, and getting better uh, documentation for uh, setting, setting up a CloudStack Cloud using uh, CentOS, that'd be, uh, that'd be great. And uh, I, it's, not like, it's not liking something, so it's starting to destroy the nodes. Okay, too bad. I promise it works, just that I haven't done it in a long time, so. Okay, thank you very much. What kind of functionality? Hello. Uh, the virtual router, what kind of functionality does that support? I mean, does it do load balancing or anything like that? Yeah, it does, um, does load balancing with HA proxy. Uh, oh, that was my second question. What yeah. way is it implemented? So it's HA proxy? Yeah, with the virtual router. So if we go here, because that's still running, and I want to add a network offering, uh, CentOS, CentOS, whatever. Um, here you see I can say I want DHCP, and who is going to provide DHCP? So it's going to be the virtual router. Uh, you see that there is also uh, Midonet, which is the SDN solution, but who is going to provide those uh, network services? So DHCP is going to be virtual router. DNS virtual router, DNS mask, uh, firewall, uh, load balancer, virtual router, and that's uh, HA proxy there. Cool. Yeah. So you know, basically here you see that uh, you can define different network offerings with different services running, and, and users like when they're gonna launch guests, they're gonna have, se they're gonna be in a guest network that have different type of network offerings. So some services maybe turned off or on, you know. Okay. Another question? Hi, I have a quick one. Um, I noticed you're talking about using Zen with Zen API a couple of times. Are you actually using Zen with Zen API or are you using Zen server? So it's supported, uh, I mean, Zen Server is supported. And then when Zen Server was not open source, it was also, uh, we were also supporting XCP, okay. which was really the open source version of Zen Server. And then the standard Zen, okay, Zen Project.
So now Zen Server has been open source, so it's like there is no XCP. So you have Zen Server open source, and the way we talk to it is really something called uh, XAPI. Thank you. Uh, does anybody else have any questions? Yeah, well, thanks. Thanks, Sebastian. Cool. Thank you. So guys, before we break for lunch, uh, we've got Tristan here from Corex who just wants to uh, tell us a couple of things about what Corex does.